The Road to Wigan Pier is an Orwell book written in 1937 that I have not read. I read uh, a fair bit of it this morning, but I, I won't claim to have read it. And so in general, I won't uh, read excerpts from, from books that I haven't at least um, well familiarized myself with. Um, but an excerpt from the end of chapter five was sent to me by a listener in England this week. And, um, and he says, the listener in England says, it's the book is not the easiest read or listen so far unless you have a particular interest in the desperate life of miners in Northern England in the 1930s. But this passage near the end of chapter five stood out, uh, end quote. So before I read this excerpt, and I, again, I have not shared it with you yet, I want to just share a little more background on the book itself as I understand it. Again, I haven't read it, but I've read a little bit of uh, critique and uh, some reviews. The first part is Orwell effectively acting as a documentarian, traveling through England, um, exploring the lives and conditions of working class people uh, in England in the 1930s between the two world wars. Of course, he doesn't know that that's the moment he's in, but he knows he's post-war, post-war one, World War One. And the second book, the second part of the book, which uh, caused quite a furor apparently, uh, is effectively Orwell's um, social analysis specifically his analysis of whether socialism is an appropriate answer to the problems um, of the people whose lives he's documented in the first half of the book. And um, in short, again, I have not uh, I have not read most of this analysis. I read a little bit of it. Um, his answer is he thinks it is. Uh, he thinks that socialism is an answer, um, does have a chance of being an effective solution, but not the way the so socialists are doing it. He, he um, has a lot of critique um, for both um, the particular way that socialists are, are doing things in the 1930s and uh, and um, more broadly for the ideology, but he does think it has a chance of doing good. And of course, um, him having this deep, careful, and nuanced argument uh, manages to piss off ideologues on both sides. So, you know, much, <laughs> much madness ensues after he publishes this book. Um, here we go then, without further ado. Um, from chapter five of Orwell's 1937, The Road to Wigan Pier. Trade since the war has had to adjust itself to meet the demands of underpaid, underfed people, with the result that a luxury is nowadays almost always cheaper than a necessity. One pair of plain solid shoes costs as much as two ultra smart pairs. For the price of one square meal, you can get two pounds of cheap sweets. You can't get much meat for three pence, but you can get a lot of fish and chips. Milk costs three pence a pint, and even mild beer costs four pence, but aspirins are seven a penny, and you can wring 40 cups of tea out of a quarter pound pot, uh, packet. And above all, there is gambling, the cheapest of all luxuries. Even people on the verge of starvation can buy a few days hope, something to live for, as they call it, by having a penny on a sweepstake. Organized gambling has now risen almost to the status of a major industry. Consider, for instance, a phenomenon like the football pools, with a turnover of about six million pounds a year, almost all of it from the pockets of working class people. I happened to be in Yorkshire when Hitler reoccupied the Rhineland. Hitler, Locarno, fascism, and the threat of war aroused hardly a flicker of interest locally, but the decision of the Football Association to stop publishing their fixtures in advance, this was an attempt to quell the football pools, flung all Yorkshire into, into a storm of, of fury. And then there was the queer spectacle of modern electrical science showering miracles upon people with empty bellies. You may shiver all night for lack of bedclothes, but in the morning you can go to the public library and read the news that has been telegraphed for your benefit from San Francisco and Singapore. 20 million people are underfed, but literally everyone in England has access to a radio. What we have lost in food, we have gained in electricity. Whole sections of the working class who have been plundered of all they really need are being compensated in part by cheap luxuries which mitigate the surface of life. Do you consider all this desirable? I don't. But it may be that the psychological adjustment which the working class are visibly making is the best they could make in the circumstances. They have neither turned revolutionary nor lost their self-respect. Merely they have kept their tempers and settled down to make the best of things on a fish and chip standard. The alternative would be God knows what continued agonies or of despair, or it might be attempted insurrections which, in a strongly governed country like England, could only lead to feudal massacres and a regime of savage repression. Of course, the post-war development of cheap luxuries has been a very fortunate thing for our rulers. It is quite likely that fish and chips, art silk stockings, tin to salmon, cut-price chocolate, five two-ounce bars for sixpence, the movies, the radio, strong tea, and the football pools have between them averted revolution. Therefore, we are sometimes told that the whole thing is an astute maneuver by the governing class, a sort of bread and circuses business, to hold the unemployed down. What I have seen of our governing class does not convince me that they have that much intelligence. 
The thing has happened, but by an unconscious process. The quite natural interaction between the manufacturer's need for a market and the need of half-starved starved people for cheap palliatives. <clears throat> the, so, three things before you start riffing. Um, this sentence in particular. Whole sections of the working class who have been plundered of all they really need are being compensated in part by cheap luxuries which mitigate the surface of life. That feels like today. And that feels like not just COVID times, right? But that feels like um, something we have been seeing and talking about since since we've known each other, since, you know, since high school, uh, since the 80s. Um, I was, uh, I, I just, I delved a little bit into the fish and chips part of this story. And apparently fish and chips were incredibly cheap, incredibly cheap. And there were an abundance of fish and chips stores in the 1930s. Um, and it started to become more and more expensive. So that doesn't sound quite right to our modern ears. In the 70s, apparently it started to get more expensive. Um, but uh, but it was very much a, a, a cheap thing that was available to everyone. And then I also... Um, I, I looked, I was thinking about a conversation we had at the end of 2021 about the price of lumber. We were told by a contractor uh, that dimensional lumber like two by fours was about to, what did he say, double? I, he didn't maybe have a prediction, triple, something, like that it had been it had been going up and down during the pandemic, but that it was about to really, really climb. You could show my screen, Zach. This is the NASDAQ's reporting on, five, on lumber prices for five years uh, since, <clears throat> since, I guess it would have been early, 2018. Um, and you see it start to spike um, during the pandemic, and it spiked higher uh, in 2021, basically before all of the um, mandates were um, were lifted. And then, of course, we got them back. And you know, here we go. That's a match um, for what we were hearing from this contractor uh, just a couple of months ago. And you know, do people need lumber? Yeah, people need lumber. Um, but can people get um, apps on their iPhone for, for dirt cheap? They can get those and they don't need those the way they need lumber. Yeah. And in fact, um, <clears throat> it's interesting that, you know, phones are almost the perfect example of yeah. what's obviously not essential for life since, frankly, we didn't have them until very recently. <laughs> right. um, but, you know, there are a lot of folks who uh, don't have homes who have phones, right? Um, right. So anyway, it's, it's pretty interesting. <laughs> A um, <clears throat> number of things struck me about that. Yeah. One, very interesting that he makes the point about uh, this having happened through an unconscious process. Mm -hmm. So no doubt there's an awful lot of collusion in our world. Um, there's also yeah. an unconscious process that does all kinds of heavy lifting for those who would collude, you know, perverse yeah. incentives that cause people to innovate mechanisms mm -hmm. um, that they don't even realize what they're participating in. Um, I was also reminded, uh, obviously, Heller is much later than Orwell, mm -hmm. but the character Milo Minderbinder <laughs> in, or in, uh, in Catch Twenty Two, Catch -22, um, such a such a marvelous exploration because Milo starts out as kind of a all American. Uh, go go to it kind of a soul who starts making life better for the pilots uh he's in charge of the uh the commissary i yep. think I and i think that's right he starts making life better by trading and he gets all sorts of yummy things from other parts of europe and brings them in and starts making money you know because so he's sort of like this uh you know shiny uh you know emblem of capitalism but over time as he moves farther and farther down this road he becomes diabolical he's in yeah. fact and he's a, and he's specifically a luxury peddler well and that's the thing right. so there's yeah. a oh, there's a marvelous exchange where um I, I hope i don't get this wrong but he has made a bad deal and he's ended up with a huge like warehouse is full of Egyptian cotton that he can't do anything <laughs> with and he tries feeding it to people and they won't eat it and um, anyway I can't remember exactly what happens I think somehow he's also traded away the um, the silk in the parachutes so at some point somebody jumps out of a plane with a parachute, but there's no parachute in it because Milo has traded traded it away. And there's oh, and this, I think he puts coupons in there or something. Like he can you can trade the parachute you don't have for their uh, <laughs> ownership stakes in the syndicate. 
right? That's right. Yeah. And the, I don't yeah. know if you remember the exchange <laughs> that ensues after this. I forget which pilot it is yeah. uh, who has died. But um, somebody, I think it's Yossarian, the sort of anti-hero of the book, is shouting at Milo for having killed this guy by substituting coupons or ownership stakes um, for his parachute. And uh, Milo's defense is, well, he died rich. And <laughs> oh. Yosarian says, uh, it's not going to do him any good. He's dead. And Milo says, well, then it'll go to his, his girlfriend. And uh, he didn't have a girlfriend. Then it'll go to his parents. They don't need it. They're rich. Then they'll understand. Oh, it's the most chilling line in the, in the whole book. I think oh, the idea wow. that that the rich would understand why this parachute was traded away and their son lost his life to it. And yeah, it's uh, <clears throat> it's mind blowing. But uh, it really, always interesting to hear Orwell, um, who basically th I feels like he thinks way ahead of his time. And which is part of why the present is so confusing, because we are seeing a lot of stuff that I thought Orwell overdrew, but actually it's just every bit as crazy as he describes it. No, what I wasn't aware of, I don't, you know, I'm not a historian by any means, and I don't, I hadn't really thought a lot about the life that Orwell lived. I had thought about his work. Um, and, you know, this is, this is something we should be allowed to do. We don't need to become aware of, um, the creator behind works, uh, in order to appreciate the works themselves and to analyze them and, and, and find value in them. Um, but one of the things that in my just tiny bit of research I was doing on this book, The Road to Wigan Pier this morning, um, that really struck me was that he actually went and traveled and lived among people whose lives he was then telling. And I would, you know, immediately I thought I would, you know, I, in, in a, in a slightly different world, um, I would like to be able to be, um, you know, on a, on a road trip now, just, you know, much as I very much wanted to be in Ottawa during the, during the truckers convoy. Um, but actually seeing people where they are, seeing how they're living and, you know, in, in direct contrast to the lies we are being told about this being the greatest economic recovery ever, right? Um, you know, act, actually, actually seeing, seeing people, um, as they are living their lives. And he, did that, and so all of his social analysis um, was not armchair theorizing. It was not abstractions. It was not, and this is in fact <clears throat> what he part of what he argues in the second half of this book, as I understand it. The little bit that I read um, is that the you know the abstractions of the largely middle class socialists who are insisting that you adopt their solutions that will never work. Are just that they are abstractions, and they're based on an imagining of human character and, frankly, human evolution. Although that wouldn't have been Orwell's framing, I don't think. Um, that simply misses the mark. You know, that isn't that isn't true. That you know, humans will not come to abide by the rules of the white collar middle class socialists um, as they are demanding uh, that that people live by. Yeah, that is really the problem with it. Is um there's an underlying game theory problem, right? It, it, it's uh, basically free rider problem. Yeah. And socialism as constructed effectively punishes contributors and rewards freeloaders. And so it's unstable, um, which doesn't mean, you know, the, those who recognize some version of that uh, often overdraw the lesson of the problem with it. They don't understand that actually yeah. your body is socialist and a family can be socialist. Um, and there are places in society where we want this, you know, the fire department and the fact that it doesn't, you know, look up your tax return before it puts the fire out in your house or right. takes you to the hospital, right? These are all places where there's some element of it that's quite right. But when I've tried to uh, later in life, the model I've I've deployed is it's not a question of do we want socialism or don't we want socialism. It's a question of in this case, do we want more of it or less of it? Right. Mm -hmm. It's an ingredient. It's not a plan. Yeah. Um, and anyway, I'd be curious to know uh, what Orwell's point was about uh, yes, socialism, but no, not the way socialists think about it. Right. <laughs> I, wonder, I wonder what he was on about. Yeah. Well, I, you know, I'll add it to my stack of books to read and 
maybe get back to all of you when I when I learn more. Cool. 